My name is Ben Dickey and I'm an elementary education major here at SFA. I chose SFA because I like the small class sizes so you can develop strong personal relationships with the professors in those classes and also I feel like there's a lot of opportunities at SFA to grow and enhance your collegiate experience. I chose elementary education as my major because I wanted to serve and give back to my community. I believe that teachers have an amazing opportunity to teach and raise the future generation and to create a better society. The reason why I like Nacogdoches is all the amazing places to hike. I love the pine trees and I love just being able to sit out of my hammock all day and read a good book. I would recommend SFA to my friends because there's amazing opportunities here to enhance your collegiate experience. Their professors here genuinely care about you and your well-being and your academic success. As always, Axum Jacks. Welcome back. We're going to keep the Lone Star Legislative Summit rolling right along and on schedule, you might notice. Now, that's what a good moderator does. So uh, we're going to go into our next session, which is education. Before we do that, though, I want to remind you, if you have questions for the panelists, I think we have some cards out that people are going to be, uh, so just hold your hand up if you want to have a, a question submitted. Uh, also, uh, we're going to be taking a break when we finish up here and moving to the, uh, the lunch event. Uh, as you may know, uh, the governor of the state of Texas, Greg Abbott, is our keynote speaker and will be speaking at noon. That's going to be down the hall of the Grand Ballroom. So when we finish this panel, we'll move that way. Uh, but uh, listen, I'm getting great response, great feedback. I want to thank our friends from the Texas School Safety Center They're just following, following in up there at the top for a wonderful program a moment ago. Um, and we're going to continue the theme of education with this panel. Uh, we're really, this is a, a special treat. I'm going to let uh, our moderator uh, do the introductions, but it's pretty unique that we have both the Senate and House Chair of Public Education uh, here in Nacogdoches on the campus of SFA to talk about this most vital of issues. What could be more important than education? And so um, I'm going to quit rambling. Uh, you're welcome. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and turn this over to our, our really, and I want the folks here in Nacogdoches, uh, those of you that have been uh, praying about our school district here and the challenges that we fa face in Nacogdoches, I think it's our single largest issue that we have to deal with and grapple with uh, in the, the, the state of our public schools in the NISD. Um, I'm proud to, to introduce to you the answer to our prayers. Uh, and that is Alton Fraley, uh, who also has the, the double distinction of serving as a, on the Board of Regents here at Stephen F. Austin State University. He is a homegrown product. Uh, he is a Central Heights Blue Devil. You may not know that, but he grew up here in Nacogdoches County and, and again, is also a, a graduate of SFA. Uh, he, he came to us. He's our interim uh, superintendent. I'm really hoping that we're going to be able to remove that tag in the near future. Uh, we'll see. I'm no, no pressure, out. I'm just, 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 just rolling around to think about it. Um, but uh, he, he's come to us. He served as a superintendent of school districts in Ohio and throughout Texas and uh, he was the, the superintendent for nine years at the KDISD, who has 74,000 students, nearly 9,000 employees. We could not have in Nacogdoches a more experienced, more qualified, more committed person for our schools than Alton Fraley. He really is, and I mean this sincerely, he literally is an answer to our prayers. And so could not be more happy, and he, he canceled to be here. He had another place he want, they wanted him to come speak. Uh, I did remind him we had the commissioner of the TEA here and, and the two chairmen of the committees, and maybe he needs to get somebody else to speak in his stead, and uh, he wanted to stay home anyway. So, uh, Alan, thank you for being here, being the moderator of our education panel. With that, ladies and gentlemen, Alan Fraley. Good morning, everyone. Uh, he is a great arm twister. He really is, and... Uh, I did change the plan, so keep that in mind, but I need something from you later on, all right? Appreciate that. Um, I'm anxious because I know that we're between you and lunch. And we haven't eaten enough here yet. Um, thank you for being here and for interest in public education. And in fact, when Texas was declaring its independence from Mexico, one of the main tenets was Mexico's failure to provide public education. And in fact, public education is important to Texas' independence and the future of our great republic. We have great leaders today and great panelists with a limited amount of time. 
but we'll try to take questions from the audience if time does permit. Let's meet our panelists. First, we have Senator Larry Taylor, District 11, uh, Parallel in Texas. He's the Chair of Education, Business and Commerce Committees, Co-Chair Culture Barrier System, Committee of the Whole, Finance, and Higher Education. We have uh, Representative G Giovanni Cabriglione. Is that close? Yeah, that's very close. Not bad for East Texas. All right. District 98, Keller, Texas. He's on the Appropriations Committee. He's chair of the Appropriations Select Committee on Budget Transparency and Reform. He's vice chair of General Investigating and Ethics, Government Transparency and Operations, Local and Consent Calendars. Representative Gina Hinojosa, former Austin ISD Trust, uh, Board of Trustees. She's uh, on the Economics and Small Business Development Committee. Homeland Security and Public Safety and House Administration. Uh, Chairman Dan Huberty, District 127, Kingwood, Texas. He's Chair of House Public Education. He's on the Pensions Committee as well. Representative Ron Simmons, District 665 out of Carrollton, Texas. He's on the Appropriations Committee, Local and Consent Calendars and Transportation. Representative Gary Van Deaver, District 1, New Boston, Texas. He's on the Appropriations Committee, Vice Chair of House Administration and Public Education. And we have Mike Morath, Commissioner of Education for the State of Texas. Uh, folks, uh, here's my thing. I don't have a single question about school finance. <laughs> but you can bring it up <laughs> if, if you choose to. Here we go. Uh, as we approach the third decade of the 21st century, should we rethink public education? For example, should public education be a common good or a consumer good? And how does the current debate about choice, privatization, vouchers, public scholarships, et cetera, factor into your response? So we'll just look, open up for everybody. <laughs> Good. Go ahead, Senator. <laughs> well, I guess I'll take the first bite. Uh, common good or consumer good, it, it, it is a common good. It is for the benefit of the people. But I think we all recognize that a little bit of competition goes a long way in improving all kinds of things. We enjoy those, those kind of advantages throughout our, our, our country. Everything from big screen TVs to uh, you name it. Competition <laughs> drives innovation. It drives increases in productivity. So, I mean, a little competition. You know, we have, we have uh, public school charters today that in some areas are, are giving kids the opportunity that they need that they're not getting their traditional public school campus. So it's very important that we have those opportunities for those kids. And, and some of them are specialized in certain areas. So a common good, it's good for all of our kids. And frankly, as Texans, you know, we, we represent a very large state, over 5.3 million students, which is more population than some states. Uh, but we have different demographics, different parts of the state, and we have different kids. And, and you know this, if your parents, even in your own household, the kids learn differently, they, they learn at different rates, they learn in different styles. And frankly, as a, in the 21st century, we had the, the tools and the ability to teach kids at their way of learning and at their pace and to get a better education for all of our kids and meet every child wherever they are. And so I, I'm just trying to promote making sure we have a good teacher in a classroom with a uh, kids getting met with their needs met in every classroom in the state of Texas. I don't want any of our kids left behind for whatever reason. Okay. Well, um, I guess I'll start with just a little bit of personal info. I have, and usually when I tell people I have three daughters aged between 10 and 12, I usually get a lot of sympathy. Yes. But, <laughs> but, but this week was extra special because this was Star Week and all three oh, of yes. uh, my daughters were taking the tests and so it was a very stressful week. Uh, this week, and so it, it was an opportunity for me to talk to my daughters about what they've been doing and and how they're doing it, maybe how that's been different than, I guess, when we were kids and so on. And so I have seen changes, and I think they're positive changes, not just in terms of technology changes that have come. Uh, they have those uh, uh, those special boards where they Prometheus board, Promethean boards where they can do things. They do all of their homework online or a lot of their work online. So. I think schools and public schools are adapting to kind of this new technology, but at the same time, the fundamentals are important, the things that have always been taught. Uh, and a lot of times I'll hear from individuals who will say, oh, well, you know, we used to do it better when I was a kid or things, things were different then. But I'm very impressed with the way that and, and the different methods that my kids are experimenting with. And, and I would say they're more advanced than, than we were. 
at this age. So I've been pretty impressed. That being said, they're still unhappy with the star test this week. So uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to get them out of that. Awesome. Well, I have one daughter, and that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> She's enough. <laughs> Well, I have two sons, and I'll say that this last session was my first session, and I supported a bill that um, prohibited suspensions for kids under second grade and younger, and I was real proud of my support for that. And then my kindergartner, first week of school, got beat up. And I had a meeting with the principal, and I said, hey, um, what are we doing with this kid? Are we going to get rid of this kid? What's going on? And um, and, um, and she reassured me and that my son was gonna be safe. She had a plan and she was working with this child. She couldn't tell me who the child was who beat up my son and he was fine. He wasn't, there were no marks on him, but it was scary for us. Um, I didn't know who the child was. And then about a month later, I was on a field trip with my son's class and I met the child and I met his mom and it turned out that the child is an Iraqi refugee and I had seen him dropped off. His dad is deaf. So I, I don't know too much about their story, but I know this child has probably been through and seen a lot. And now my son and this child are good friends and the principal is right. She, she worked with this child. The child is excelling. This is a child who made the teacher cry the first week of school as well. <laughs> kindergarten. I tell that story because um, as parents, we might think about schools as, well, we, we want to go to a, a, a school where maybe there aren't those kinds of kids. Um, but as policymakers, I think it's important that who we are is we're public schools and we take all kids. And I, I, so I think it's got to be beyond a marketplace decision. It's got to be about our values and um, I, ha I filed a bill last session that said charter schools can't keep kids out because of their disciplinary record, just like public schools can't. And it makes our work harder, and it's probably half the battle for our teachers, discipline in, in the classroom. But I think it's important, and it, it speaks to who we are. I just do what they tell me, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, so I think the, the answer is that the, the, the process of public education is, is that we are providing a common good for our businesses and our communities. Um, the, end, the end game is that there's a product that's supposed to come out at the end of, of, of 12th grade uh, where there's supposed to be an educated, uh, responsible citizen that's supposed to be able to get a job and or go to a four-year um, uh, get a four-year education. We've spent a lot of time, Chairman Taylor, myself, and our committees have spent a lot of time talking about career and technical education. We think that's a really important thing uh, for, for our, our, our kids because not every kid's going to go to college, but at the same time, they have to have a skilled, skilled work set that's associated with that. And so that's a lot of what we've, we've focused on. Um, right now, Chairman Taylor, myself, and, and another uh, I don't know, 13 members uh, of, or 11 members of a committee are spending time on uh, the School Finance Commission. And we've spent a tremendous amount of time already. We've kicked that off. Um, we've got meetings next week, working on work groups and thing, fi figuring all those things out. It's complicated. You know, it's very, very complicated, uh, especially with the fact that you have um, Hurricane Harvey and the impact of what Harvey's going to have in this next legislative session, I think, is going to be very significant. Uh, billions of dollars of damage to schools, um, you know, in my community specifically down in Houston, Lake Houston area, 17,000 homes were damages, Kingwood High School was $90 million worth of damage by itself. So those are some of the issues that we're going to be dealing with. Then specifically when you talk about, you know, choice and opportunities, you know, one of the things that we did this past session is we did provide funding uh, for charter schools, the first time that that's ever happened. Um, but, but part of the reason that, that, that I was supportive of that is because back in 2013 when we had the uh, implementation of HB5, and we had Senate Bill 2 at the time, uh, the intent was is that we were all talking about getting rid of caps on charter schools. In fact, what happened was is that it actually gave the authority to the commissioner uh, to be able to get rid of the bad ones, to get rid of the bad charter school operators and get rid of the, the guys that are behaving poorly uh, in a much quicker basis so that you can incentivize the good ones that are out there um, and I think part of what I'd like to see as we go forward is there, there seems to be um, 
you know, we, we are, and I think Commissioner, you've done a good job of doing that and, and, and getting rid of those, the, the, the bad actors. Uh, but as we go into this next legislative session, you know, we have to make sure that, that we don't have any kids that are failing. And, and we've got to make sure that we incentivize um, some of those schools, like a KIPP and a YES and IDEA and, and, and some of those other schools that are out there that actually can provide those reliefs, can Academy from a dropout recovery perspective. Uh, you know, this is, this is in some cases the last resort for these kids. This is it. This is the only place where they, they have. So we have to make it, we have to make it, it, create these opportunities for these kids to do it. And then, you know, Chair, uh, Chairman Simmons and I um, worked, um, and we didn't quite get there, get to a meeting of the minds, but, you know, dealing with our special needs children too. I think that's a really important thing from a, from, from a perspective of creating those opportunities. Chairman Taylor uh, made sure that we got funding for aut autism and dyslexia in the charter schools. That was really important, I think. Um, and I'd like to see us work on that during this next session because there's, there's a lot of those kids that out there that aren't getting the services that they need. Um, and we, it's gonna be very important for us to do that. But, uh, you know, I, my uh, mom and dad were both public school teachers, and my dad just retired last May at age 81 as a high school band director. So I grew up in a family of public school teachers. My wife was a teacher. My daughter-in-law is a teacher. My uh, niece is a teacher. So public education has been really important. And I uh, appreciate uh, Chairman Huberty's words there. I also have a special needs son who's a young adult now. So we went through the entire process of, you know, what's the best education environment for him? And, and the fact of the matter is, is that no matter how hard sometimes we try, the way our current public education system is set up, it doesn't always meet the needs. So we continue to work on making some adjustments to, to make sure that those kids get their opportunities as well. But on school, I would like to talk about school finance for just a minute. I think the thing that we need, and I'm not on that commission, I know these guys are, are doing a great job, but the thing that we have to remember is that there's only one taxpayer in Texas, essentially, and that's you and me, right? And we have four sources of revenue. We have, the, we have property tax, we have sales tax, we have oil and gas severance tax, and we have the business franchise tax. So if the state needs to put more money into schools, and I'm, I'm not saying we do or we don't, but if we do, it either has to come through a revenue increase in those scenarios, or it has to come through a reduction in spending in another place. And there's no other place to reduce spending other essentially than health and human services because they make up 40% of our budget like education does. The rest of it is in a relative sense, a small amount compared to that. And so it's a very, very, as Chairman Huber said, a difficult process. We're not gonna vote to raise property taxes. I don't think we're gonna vote to raise sales tax oil and gas industry is already paying a lot and I think the businesses would line up and say hey we're already paying enough as well so it's a it is a very complicated <coughs> process and I promise you every health and human service program has constituents standing behind it saying hey don't don't cut here so it's not that always that we don't want to do it it is always a measurement of good versus best and that's that's the struggle that we're in I think we're going to get there but that's that's the way I see it. Thanks, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I am a retired school superintendent, former teacher, principal, superintendent. So I, I have a, maybe a little different perspective than, than some. Uh, having been in the system, uh, I, I believe that our public education system is a common good, and as my colleagues believe. Um, and and I, we hear a lot about competition, and, and I don't think anyone would argue against competition. Uh, my, my concern with many of the efforts for competition is, uh, are, is, the, is the field level. And, and I think uh, we have to be careful that we not create an unlevel playing field. That, that you know, if, if we, if, if a entity, a, a school receives state dollars, um, then meet state accountability. Um, you know, uh, have the same state, have the same enrollment uh, policies as, as our public schools. You know, I, I just think there are some things that we can put in place. Uh, I, I'm obviously, uh, I say obviously, you may or may not know, I, I, it's no secret that I'm opposed to vouchers, uh, but, but I, 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 and so I think we inter interchange those terms a lot, voucher and, and, and competition, voucher and school choice, and, and so I think we get confused sometimes about what we're talking about 
uh, when we when we use those terms. But uh, we we know that our schools uh, have <coughs> battles today that they didn't have 10, 15, 20 years ago. We know the the challenges that that we face, and and we also have. Uh, piles of, of, of research that tells uh, that will tell us that the one single most important factor in, in making a, a school successful is the teacher in the classroom, and so we I think we whatever we do we have to focus on on attracting uh, quality teachers, training them before they enter the classroom, giving them high quality training uh, through our educational programs uh, at universities just like this one and and uh, uh, having high quality teacher training and then uh, supporting them after they're in the classroom. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I wish I had the answers. I, I don't, and I don't think any individual up here uh, has the answers, but we are all committed to, to working together to, to arrive at those answers, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, if I could just add one thing. When I talk about competition, uh, it's not hypothetical. I mean, we have competition in the state already. If you live in a suburb, you ask parents where they chose to live, people have the means to choose to live based on the school system. So they're, they're exercising Absolutely. competition. And those schools are competing for the best teachers and the best uh, facilities and performance and all these different things. And even whether we've had charters come in, even the larger metropolitan districts, they've got performing arts schools, medical schools, and all these health professionals. All these things are competition. If you, did, if you just had the one, I guarantee you wouldn't have any of that, but we do have competition already. And as far as the level playing field, we have some families who aren't on that level playing field because they do not have the means to make those kind of choices. So, you know, if your neighborhood school is not a well-performing school and that's all the money you have and you're stuck there, that's, that's some of the students that we need to reach. And frankly, that's our fastest growing demographic in the state of Texas. And we're not doing a great job in the, some of those areas. So competition will improve and it's already shown to do that within the public school system where they have competition, Austin ISD is even upping their game faced by the competition they're having from charters. And who benefits from that but the students? So that's what I'm trying to do is make sure that all of our students have the opportunity to make those kind of choices. So we do level the playing field in that way. If I, 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 I want to speak to that point it, and say this, that I'm not going to disagree that competition in, in, in charter schools have has made a, um, ISDs up their game. Um, I question what is the end game. During the, I think it was during the School Finance um, Commission hearings, Senator West said, how do we make decisions even? Where we're putting these state-funded charters? Because some are being put by schools that are well-performing schools that taxpayers have already invested in, in my district. And so, but we don't have any criteria of, should they go here or not go th here? So I think that is something we should be looking at. I do worry just what is the end game with the growth of charters. I, I know that we now have a decrease of 2.68 billion in our school district state aid um, since 2016, 2016, 2019, and our charter school state aid has, aid has increased 1.46 billion. So we are making choices about where we're putting money, and I just think we need to make sure we're smart about about those choices. For the record, the commission is right in the middle, literally. That's me. <laughs> How'd that happen? <laughs> All right. One more uh, question that may provoke, provoke a thought or two. Uh, I've heard folks say that if you have a good school system, you will then have a good community. I've heard others say that the schools are really a lagging indicator versus the leading indicator and in that if you have a good community, you have a better chance of having a good school system. What are your thoughts about that? I'll, I'll take a bite at this one. So um, this, is a, this, is a, hang on, yeah. this is a great sort of chicken and the egg question right. and I think policymakers uh, uh, wrestle with the answer, policymakers at all levels, whether you're talking about school board members or state legislative policymakers. But uh, let me share a, sort of an example. So there's a, there's a famous educational experiment that was started uh, about 25, maybe even 30 years ago in Harlem, um, uh, led by a guy named Jeffrey Canada, the Harlem Children's Zone. Uh, 
Um, what uh, he decided to do was to carve out um, uh, a, a bunch of city blocks in, uh, in that portion of New York City and, um, and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take responsibility for 10,000 kids, top to bottom. Like, when, mommy, when mama's pregnant, um, all the way to uh, graduation from college. Um, and methodically um, uh, 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 organized improvements in campuses, um, uh, recruiting and retaining the best teachers, um, uh, building summer learning programs, changing curriculum on a wholesale basis, setting extraordinarily high expectations for the adults, um, uh, uh, and similar expectations for the students. Um, leaving nothing to chance, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with uh, p uh, parents early. I'm going to set up strong early childhood systems. When kids are in high school, I'm going to actually build a counseling apparatus that gets them into college and then keeps supporting them through college. And what has happened over the course of this 25-year experiment is um, if you were in Harlem uh, 25 years ago and you asked a kid on the streets, hey, uh, can, you, can you talk to me about a you know, family member, somebody that you know that's a college graduate, they would have to think long and hard. Um, but if you talk to me about somebody that you know that might have some interaction with the judicial system, you would have pretty quick responses to it. But today, that has flipped. Um, uh, the, the number of college graduates that have come out of this pathway, this very systemic, um, very focused, very intentional effort to improve schools, has caused a huge infusion of, of, of higher levels of education in the community. That, in turn, spurred an economic metamorphosis for, uh, for Harlem. Um, and so I actually, think, I actually think we know the answer to this question. Like, I don't, I don't think they're, they're disconnected. Clearly, a community in decline can be reflected um, in subsequent declines in the schools for the same reason Representative Hinojosa um, you know, commented, these are public schools, these are schools that the public owns. If the public abdicates responsibility for performance in those schools, then you will see decline. If the public takes responsibility for, for performance increases, then it, will, then it will rise. But I don't think we should make any mistake. There's a causal relationship um, between the schools and then the vibrancy of the community. And um, we can improve the schools. We, we do not have to make excuses. We do not have to say that poverty is destiny. Um, there, it is difficult. This is extraordinarily difficult work. But we have enough examples of success to know that you can, you can see significant improvements in educational outcomes, and then that has significant improvements in the community. So I don't, you know, I, I, we have to be sensitive to all of these factors. You have to, you have to try to heal communities that are broken. Um, but we have to methodically focus on making sure kids can read, write, and do math at high levels. And if we do that, um, then it becomes a lot easier to improve the economic vibrancy of those communities. And I would say we've seen that at the macro level in our country. As we improved education, our, our country improved. And frankly, we've seen it even within Texas public schools where a, a school district has not been doing well. They've gotten new leadership in, innovative changes and things and they're turning those schools around. And it's too early to see now, but you know that's gonna change the outcome of that community because the biggest fix for poverty is a good education and a great job. Because the kids that get that are not gonna go back to the situation they grew up in. Once you've got a good education and a good job, there's no need to live in poverty. So that's, I mean, that's how you improve a community. Frankly, that's what we're all about in Texas. We are facing challenges in this state. Looking at our demographics, we are facing great challenges. The NAEP scores just came out. We're doing above average in every, every class individually, but as an average, we're doing, we fell. We're like in the 40s. You know, that's great if you're playing golf and you get adjust for a handicap, <laughs> but in competition like we're in with global competition, you don't get to adjust for a handicap. We have to do this. We have to improve the educational opportunity for every one of our students because our poor students are the ones that's the fastest growing demographic today. And if we don't fix that and change that curve, this state will not be the state it is today in the future. So this is of utmost importance. And I do believe the school can make a difference in changing that community, but you've got to change expectations. And sometimes you have to change the leadership and willingness to go forth to do what you need to do to get a job done. You know, I, 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 when you think about the big, bigger suburban school districts that are out there, everybody says, oh, you know, they're, they're doing fine. But the reality is, is that within those school districts is a subset of schools. And, and just as you, you know, when you ran Katie, you know, you've got, some affluent areas in, in KD and, and not so affluent areas. And, and I think what, what we're missing is, is that when you're getting a grade of, a, of an humble ISD as an example that comes out and says, hey, it's, you know, 
you know, making a B or, you know, they're doing okay. The reality is you have to drill down a little bit further and you have to look at it and say, okay, what about what's going on at North Belt or Humble Elementary? What's going on with those campuses? And where, where, what, are the, what are the teachers like there? What's the experience level? And how do you incentivize those teachers? Just like uh, Representative Van Deber said, you know, the teacher is the most important part of the classroom. And how do we incentivize and get the best possible teachers to go into those schools uh, and incentivize those? Because sure, everybody wants to go teach in, you know, Bear Branch Elementary and, you know, right in the middle of Kingwood, Texas, right? You know, that's a, that's, that's a job that those teachers want. But how do we get those incentivized to get into North Belt or into Humble or into Lakeland or someplace where those kids need it? You know, there's no PTA, as an example. There's no support system from the parents because in a lot of cases, they're single moms or single families that are out there and they don't have time because they're working two jobs and, and those kids aren't, aren't doing where, where it's at. And, you know, we've seen that same example you know, in Houston ISD, as an example, you've got, you know, schools like Kashmir that's been on IR for going on 10 years. Yeah. You know, we failed a generation of children. Yeah, I mean, the majority of the schools are doing okay. So I, I think that the indicator really is, is is that, you know, you have to look, you have to peel the onion back a little bit and look at all those things from the school's perspective. Even though the school may be, they say, oh, the school district's doing great and people move there. Um, you have to look at the, at the whole, I think, is going to, and that's, that's part of what we're trying to do and accomplish you know, we're talking about, you know, school finance and how do we incentivize them and teacher pay and all those things that are going to be really critical for us. And getting, you know, getting more teachers that, 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 that want to be in the, in, in, in the business of teaching children, um, that's, that's going to be critical for us. All right, great. Let's talk about teacher shortages. You know, uh, there's a lot of talk about that. And in today's highly and politically charged environment, why would you want to be a teacher? And what are your thoughts about ways to improve teacher recruitment, uh, training, and retention? So before this panel, and since this was a title, I, I decided to go and talk to a few teachers and say, hey, you know, what gets you into this field? Uh, what makes you want to stay? And almost to a person, all of them had told me that they really love this job. They've always wanted to be a teacher. They think they're doing a lot of good helping kids but most of them cannot afford to be a teacher anymore. Um, they talk to me about, um, you know, they're having to with, uh, <clears throat> obviously with their school loans, with rent, with property taxes, whatever it is, they're finding it more and more difficult to be able to keep this job. And from what I've been able to determine, that is probably the, the biggest issue that we have in terms of retaining current teachers uh, current teachers look at what our, our benefits are doing or, or not doing when they retire. And so some of the reasons maybe they had gotten to this are not there anymore. And uh, so I think that's a challenge. And I think just like in any industry and in any company, if you want to hire the best talent, if you want to keep the best talent, you have to be competitive, not just with, hey, we're going to be competitive with, with our education, our curriculum. We also have to be competitive with our, our pay scale as well. And so the number two factor, which kind of maybe is something more you were uh, leaning to, but is a lot of them are saying that they're seeing more and more uh, aggressive uh, tendencies by their students. And they're finding it very difficult, um, whether it's because they're distracted by social media or things at home, or whether it's just simply that uh, we've lost a lot of uh, the ability to be able to discipline. The, the kids while they're there. But either way, those two uh, factors seem to be the, the, the top reasons why teachers are finding it difficult to want to stay and, and continue to be in this field. And I think those are some of the things that we have to look at and trying to determine in the next sessions so that we don't just offload this to charter schools and private schools and that kind of stuff. If we want good public schools, uh, we're going to have to focus on keeping our teachers. Thanks, sir. Yeah, and I, I agree. You know, that we we have to we have to find a way to to pay our teachers better to incentivize uh, young people to enter the profession. Uh, it's been my experience in uh, you know working with teachers, and uh, I have a, a daughter who is in her fifth year of teaching, so she's a, a beginning teacher, and I I, I hear her uh, you know what the the challenges that she deals with, and, and I really think that a, a, a really high quality teacher really doesn't see it as a job. And, and, and I think pay is important, but I, I really don't think that's the most important thing to, to a young teacher. Uh, I think, think a, a really 
uh, high quality teacher, it's almost a calling. It is a calling, I think, and and they see it that way, and and they they believe they're making a difference, and 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 all they want, many of them, all all they really want is to to feel they're safe in their classrooms, they're supported by their their administration, and and they're given adequate funding to to uh, be able to teach, and and a salary they can live on, and and how we get there, I I don't know, but but. Um, you know, I think society today, the, the teacher as well as, you know, we see it with policemen and, and other professionals uh, are just not given the level of respect they once were. And, and I, I don't know how we get back to that, but I, I really think uh, teachers uh, really would like to, to get back to that level of respect, feeling good about what they're doing. They, they go home in the evenings, they, they feel they have accomplished something, and they feel they are moving the needle in making our state a better state, society a better society. So I recently met with a teacher um, preparation program, people who work in a teacher, creating a teacher preparation program. And they pointed out to me that, that we put all these requirements on teachers and we only give them, we give them a limit of 18 hours in their degree program to learn how to teach because we make them focus in a subject matter area instead. And, 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 I, and I think we should rethink that because with all the difficulties in the classroom, classroom management being paramount and with um, having to teach kids from different backgrounds and special ed and um, identifying dyslexia and how you um, teach dyslexic kids. And, I, I think that um, teachers need tools, and so we need to make sure that we're, we're preparing our teachers so that they feel well equipped to take on this challenge. We also have a decrease now, a significant decrease in the teachers that are going through a traditional um, certification program in, and more going into an alternative certification program. And we know with retention, it's like, there's a, a, a 10 percentage point decrease in retention at five years, after five years or at five years for those alternative certification teachers. And, and everything I've heard is that five years, that's kind of your sweet spot after which it takes you about five years to, to um, feel like you've really, you've really got this thing um, mastered. So I think too we need to the legislature has a tendency, we like to tell everybody else what to do. <laughs> and I think we might want to step back and think maybe we should engage with educators about what they need in their teacher preparation programs. I, I agree that education is a calling. And, and the really the best teachers, we all had them. We know them. It was their mission. They took it very passionately. And, and frankly, I've seen what I would like to see the 21st century classroom look like. It's called blended learning, and there's a number of schools and campuses across Texas that are doing this. In blended learning, they're basically bringing in technology. And you know, in the traditional classroom, you had all the chairs facing the teacher, the teacher lectures, and you know, kids have different learning styles. But in the blended learning, they're blending technology, and they actually sit in like rectangular tables and face each other. And, they're, and I walked into eighth grade. You all remember eighth grade, right? This is a junior high in Pasadena. Thompson Intermediate, lower income, high minority, but these kids were in these classrooms with 100% engagement. Y'all remember eighth grade? Was anybody 100% engaged in what the teacher was doing? Didn't happen. Not on the teacher. No. Right. We were all engaged, but it was not necessarily what the teacher was doing. But I'm talking about 100% engagement, and they were all working. They were looking, you know, some of them were looking at a video, some were reading, some, some were listening to things. All these different learning styles, and then the teacher said, you're ready to work together as a group. And it's just like, a beehive of activity. They're all, what are you doing on this? What are you doing? And they were excited. And so went to three different subjects. And they're all the very same way. And before I left, I went and just saw a traditional classroom. And there was a traditional desk and rows and the teachers working hard, a great teacher. But you could see the typical eighth grade. They weren't all there. And talk about discipline. If the kids are 100% engaged in what's going on in that classroom, you don't have the same discipline problems. If they're all working at their same pace, you don't have the the kids that's moving faster than that particular subject is not bored because they're still going. So you have 100% engagement. The teachers love it. I've heard another uh, superintendent down in Port Isabel, well, they call it some Point Isabel, I think, at the school district. 26-year teacher was just about burned out. 
decided to try this blended learning thing. She's in that class. She says it's the best teaching experience she's ever had. She does not want to quit. She loves it. So you want teachers who have a passion and they are having fun and they're actually getting to spend individual time with each student for like a several, uh, an hour every week with every student in their class to see where they are setting their goals for their self-paced and monitoring that and just walk around helping the kids that need help. The teachers love it. The kids love it. That is a home run for education in Texas. So if you have a chance to see that, I recommend you do that. It's, it's expanding. The, we've got some schools have gone out to California to get the training. We have the uh, Raise Your Hand Texas is helping with some of the schools here. Mm -hmm. And it's growing. They're, ra they're training teachers here to train other teachers. But to me, that's the 21st century class we need to be reaching for. And I think it will help solve a lot of these problems with our discipline, lack of attention, and boredom in our classrooms. So I'm, I'm excited about it. You know, I think the, the other thing, because this is a little bit off the teacher recruitment scenario, but the item that we hesitate to talk about is the fact that we can do everything that we've talked about up here and should, but it's very hard to have success unless you have some type of parental engagement. I mean, listening to my parents and my wife and my my daughter-in-law and my niece, that's where they always saw the difference. My mom taught in Mesquite in a, in a school district, Hanby Elementary, that uh, had a population where a lot of times the parents weren't very involved, either because they were having to work two or three jobs, whatever the reasons were. But we have to provide as much as we can of the legislature, and we're limited because we're not a nanny state, but we have to figure out how to provide incentives to encourage healthy, uh, healthy families, right? I mean, that's whatever that looks like, and I'm not defining what that looks like, but we have to be able to do that. We know, I think studies will tell us, that if, if at least one parent is engaged, that has a huge impact on whether or not that student does well. It doesn't cover everything, but it has a huge impact on that. And when we have some, uh, some of our populations that have 50 to 60 to 70 percent of new children being born without both a mother and a father around, I mean, we can do all of these great programs, and those kids, uh, I think studies would show that their chances of success are significantly less. So somehow we have to figure out that scenario as well. And it, I'll, real quick, I would say that uh, the one thing that we've been trying to work on, uh, you know, you get more than 50 percent of your teachers are in alt cert programs right now, um, some of which are some of which are good, some of which are not so good. Um, the traditional method of delivery, whether it's at SFA or UH or some other place, um, has changed dramatically. Uh, but I think what we what we've seen the big problem is is that the the amount of of, of work and and load that we put on top of the teacher in addition to their normal tasks of actually teaching whether it's prepping for star tests you know geo just mentioned about the star test i've got three kids and they're prepping for the star test as well um you know we're we're, we're, we're again we hear this all the time and it's true they're teaching to a test um you know and so they, they've basically taken away a lot of the ability for a teacher to be a teacher anymore and we need to get back to allowing them to be able to do that. And then in addition to that, um, you know, you think about the education code and how big it is and all the, you know, all the requirements that we put on top of teachers and we put on school districts and, and all the mandates and all these things that we do uh, it, it has become ridiculous. And it's become very, very difficult for teachers to be able to be effective because they're so worried about, you know, what's the test score, what's going to be happening. We should be measuring growth of students uh, and where that student starts at the beginning of the year to the end of the year. That's what we should be focusing on because we can't control who had that kid the year before or where that kid came from. And so that's really, I think, the focus is in, in rewarding the teachers from, from that perspective and making it a true profession. Um, you know, and I know this may not be popular because I'm sure there's some teachers in the room, but, you know, we, and I was on a school board and we always struggled with, you know, you get X a, a pot of money at the end of the year and you're like, okay, well, we're just going to give everybody a 2% pay raise. Well, what about the teachers that are going above and beyond? I mean, in regular business, you know, the, not everybody gets a, a pay raise. You know, it should be based upon incentivizing them. Or are they willing to go get extra workload and go teach STEM or go into a Title I campus? I mean, that's where we need to start thinking about resources and saying, how do we incentivize? How do, again, I'm focusing on, I, I think, about Title I campuses. 
my cousin uh, uh, teaches uh, in, in, in the school district, and she, and she went and taught in Title I campus for five years, but then she left when she got done with her five years. And I said, why didn't she stay? And she says, well, I just didn't want to, you know, the discipline problems and all the other things that went with it. You know, here's a, here's, here's a young lady that, that, that understood those kids and left. How, how do we get them to stay? And it's, in, it's incentive-based. It needs to be incentive-based. That's, that's how we do that, I think, as we go forward. And I'll, I'll just add, there's some districts that are doing that. Yep. The Dallas ISD is a perfect example. They're training it. They're getting their best teachers, recognizing who they are, and then paying them extra if they'll go into their Title I camps. And they're turning campuses around in yep. dramatic fashion uh, by doing that. So these innovations are happening. We just need to keep promoting and pushing them out uh, to all the districts. But it's, it's exciting. But we do have to do it. We, we have shortages of teachers in high-level science and math. But we pay them the same as a kindergarten teacher. And we have a, a lot of teachers in some areas. So in business, if you have a shortage in one area, you pay that area more. And then we also have schools that are going out and reaching out and creating their own teachers. They're identifying students that are in their schools today. They're saying, if you'll, go t if you'll do teaching, we'll help you pay for your college. And then we'll let you come back here and work here right. and let you do some of your t student teaching. And they're creating their own teachers for their own system. So there's things that these innovative superintendents and leadership are already doing. We just need to make sure that the state doesn't get in the way and we help promote those types of innovations. I think it, just real quickly, I think it's important that we recognize too at the state level that, that, that we, are, we expect the school to address all ills of society. Anything that, that we recognize in society, we, we put it on the school and you know everything from sex education to obesity to driver's ed training, you know, we, we expect the school to address it. And we can't continue to load the school down and, and expect the same outcomes that we used to have. And so I'm, I'm not saying that we, we, we don't put those into the school. I'm just saying that, that we recognize the fact that, that we expect our schools to be the answer to, 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 to all problems. It, it goes back to the, the family situation and, and, and other societal ills. Awesome. I'm going to ask another question while we gather any of the questions you guys may have from the audience, okay? So um, what, uh, what impact, if any, do you feel state and federal accountability systems have had on teacher recruitment and retention? Sure. Um, so... <laughs> Don't be so excited about it, for crying out loud. <laughs> and is someone kind of gathered, collect the questions for me? So the, the teaching is quite possibly the most difficult job I've ever been exposed to. I ran a software company. Um, we wrote lines of code. Um, what do our schools do? Do they write lines of code? No. Well, actually, they do. Um, what about building buildings? You know, if, if we if we got a project management um, office and and uh, are, are in the construction business. Um, how does that compare to teaching? Uh, well, it turns out school districts have to do that too. What about um, running food service operations? Because you know, you get in the restaurant business. Well, it turns out school districts do that too. What about um, uh, transit um, operations? We're you know, run, running some sort of mass transit operations. That, you know, we, don't, you know, we don't do that because we're there to teach kids. Actually, no, we do that too. But, um, and so you think about the sort of business operation of a school district. It's, unbelievably complicated, but at its core, the reason that we exist is because we want, um, we want kids, we want kids starting three, four, five year old bundles of energy um, to um, learn uh, uh, everything that we can possibly teach them. We want them to reach their God-given potential. We want them over the course of 15 years to turn into self-aware members of the Republic. And this job that is teaching in the classroom uh, you, you know, you think about for a moment what, um, what, what neurosurgeons do. And a neurosurgeon will, um, will before surgery, they'll, um, he or she will they'll cleanse their body of impurities, um, scrubbing themselves because years and years of repeated behavior has built that um, uh, into them, sort of automatic. And then think about what they read in the most recent medical journal about some promising practice or the lasers or scalpels that they'll need to use during the surgery. And then they'll think about everything they read about uh, and studied on this one patient's case history and all the things that could go right or wrong during that surgery. And then they walk into the operating room and there's one brain that they're responsible for and that brain is asleep on the table. 
and our teachers walk into operating rooms every day and there's not one brain that they're responsible for but there's 20 or sometimes more and and no one's asleep they are you know the patient is giving active feedback during the surgery um, it is it is extraordinarily difficult work yes. and at the same time you know the the kinds of expectations that we have for kids um, we think in Texas that every third grader should um, memorize their times tables it's actually a it is a standard, it is a, it is a stated expectation. We don't care what your family background is, we don't care what your zip code is, we don't care what you look like. Um, if, you were, if you were born to the, to the Huxtables, you were born to Ozzie and Harriet, or you were, you're in a foster care, regardless what the situation, if you are in third grade, we expect you to have memorized your times tables because, um, because life is awfully demanding. Um, and yes, we want you to overcome, but we need you to be prepared for a certain level of proficiency in order to succeed. And so you have, a, you have teachers who have um, this job of all their third graders that have to learn the times tables, and by the way, a lot more than that um, in third grade, just in mathematics, and oh, by the way, English um, and literature and social studies and science and physical education and fine arts. And all of these things have to, be, have to be taught. It is the expectation that we have for all of our kids. And it's good to have the, these expectations for all of our kids because we did not always have these common expectations for all of our kids. We did not always think, you know, our little girls, they don't actually need to know science. We did not always think, you know what, um, you're, you, you know, given your racial background, we need to prepare you for a, a carpentry, right? We did not always have these consistently high expectations for all of our kids, but we do, and this is good. But this is darn hard, and this is, in fact, the basis of all of these accountability systems. It is a question of whether or not we are meeting these expectations for our young people. I mean, if we, in fact, do expect all of our third graders to have mastered our times table, how do we know whether that expectation is being met? The job of teaching, the practice of teaching is daily formative assessments. Like I want to check to make sure all my kids knew this and at the end of the year I want to do a quick dipstick and make sure that everybody mastered everything that they were needed to master. Um, it, it just turns out that that is, that is remarkably difficult and we can look back with halcyon eyes of how this system worked in like the 1950s and we think you know it was better back then. But we didn't have these expectations back then. Right. Re Representative Caprilioni mentioned, like, our kids today, they are, in fact, learning much more than we ever knew. It's like a Louis Armstrong song writ large. And, um, and it, is, it is difficult. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about the, the expectations of state accountability systems, of federal accountability systems, it is this moral communication that we expect to achieve this standard for all of our kids. Um, and it is difficult. And so the job of teaching is fundamentally more difficult today than it was 20 or 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, or 50 years ago. And the job of our school systems is, is more difficult. Like in the 1940s, we didn't, we didn't actually feed kids in school. We do that now writ large. Um, we didn't have transportation systems in the 1920s. Our, you know, our transportation technology was more limited then. But like every year, uh, every, every decade, there's a new responsibility um, placed on our teachers, placed on our schools, and it is, it is difficult. So if you ask me, like, is it the accountability system itself that is causing disruption, it is, it is the job is hard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we're mm -hmm. recruiting somebody right out of college to come into this job, we're going to pay them forty, forty-five thousand dollars $45,000 a year. It's not, not a bad wage for somebody with a bachelor's degree. It's actually pretty competitive. But you're going to work 60 hours a week. Uh, you're going to spend your personal money on your kids. You're going to come home crying once every other week about some truly horrendous story that you heard. Um, and um, fast forward 10 years, and now you're making $5,000 more. And all of your peers in, you know, that you went to college with, the ones that decided to pursue exciting careers in law, um, you know, they're, they're making $30,000 more than you immediately. Um, you know, teaching is a passion. It is a calling. But it is difficult work. And everybody makes basic trade-offs for their families. Mm -hmm. And if I'm looking at making trade-offs for my families and my wage is $80,000 versus $40,000, I'm going to make different choices as a result of those, uh, that framework. So um, there are so many complicated factors. We've got to prepare people rigorously, relentlessly. I mean, we, we pay Marine Corps privates about $18,000 a year. But nobody thinks of Marines as, as you know, anybody 
anybody can do this job. We, we think the few, the proud, the Marines, because they go through boot camp and they vomit repeatedly and they're exposed to nerve toxins and all kinds of stuff. It is hard to prepare um, for the Marine Corps. And yet we have billboards that say, want to teach, when can you start? For, for simultaneous neurosurgeons doing 20 simultaneous surgeries every day, 180 days a year uh, in a row. Um, it, is, uh, it is a difficult, difficult profession. And we've got to be sensitive to what we do to recruit the best and brightest minds what we do to prepare them, what we do to support them while they're in the profession, how we compensate and reward them um, to pursue excellence and to, to stick around, to take the hardest jobs, not the easiest. Um, we have to be sensitive to this entire spectrum. We at TEA have got a strategic plan that is focused on trying to impact all of these areas. Um, and some things are in our control and some things will certainly require legislative support. And I think, as you heard the members today, Everybody is sensitive to the challenges that we face, um, uh, but there are no easy solutions. Uh, and it's, it's, it's darned hard work and it's gonna take a relentless focus and we could get everything right tomorrow and nobody would notice for a decade because the kids still have to grow up in this system. Um, and we're not gonna get everything right tomorrow because um, this is a extraordinarily difficult enterprise, the enterprise of making sure that the next generation of Texans has it better than the last. Uh, so, um, Anyways, I, I forgot the question now. Yeah, clearly, <laughs> clearly, clearly you forgot the question, but hopefully you adequately answered it. Okay, well actually, I'm, I'm gonna say amen to what you said. Um, when you think about uh, the neurosurgeon, he's not worrying about the fight in the hallway in surgery. He's not worrying about uh, uh, someone storming into his classroom, into the operating room, he's uh, not even worried telling him how to do the surgery and gotcha. Uh, following up with that, we have about four minutes left now and a lot of questions have come in. Uh, let's try this one. This one kind of relates to uh, what we've talked about. And uh, it's why we're we wasting our time striving to design a one-size-fits-all education for a level playing field when reality is unique, the playing fields of Texas are diverse, and our players come in all sizes. <laughs> Any thoughts about that? Well, I I hope that's what you heard, that we are trying to design a system that's more suited to every student. Uh, we're getting away from the one-size-fits-all. In fact, the one-size-fits-all system was designed back in Europe when they were training up people to be assembly line workers. Well, the, the worker of today and going forward, these kids are graduating today and we're doing things we've never even heard of. So in an assembly line, you don't want creativity. For these kids, they need creativity. They need to learn how to learn because what they're going to be doing, we don't even know what it is yet. So. Uh, well, we're trying to do that, so hopefully you've heard some of that today. Great, great. Uh, one of the panelists mentioned that teachers need to feel a level of respect. How do you feel the difference between ERS care and TRS care for active and retired teachers affect teacher uh, retention and recruiting? And I've got two questions about that. Um, you know, <laughs> I, don't let anybody jump in there. Um, <laughs> one at a time. Well, look, I, I, I was part of the group, and, and, and we worked certainly with the Senate hand in hand, and this as we got forward, certainly fix it in the special session. But it is a, it, the TRS care is a complex problem. Um, the, the cost of TRS care, and I know everybody, you know, maybe doesn't understand the whole, the whole parameters of it, but when we dug into it last time, the biggest increased cost was, it was a $700 million increase in, in prescription drugs. $700 million year over year. It's huge. And I think, Gio, you were on that, that group with me where we were trying to figure out how, to, how do we deal with this. The, the program was never built so that, and, and if you've retired, I apologize for this, the program was never built for somebody to retire at 56 years of age and, and, and for us, for them not to have any premium increases of health insurance. Health insurance at, at all levels are out of control. I know what our costs are and, and they're continuing to increase. And we're looking at it and say, how do we shore up the system so to make sure that it is sustainable as we go forward? Um, we put over a billion dollars, the legislature's put over a billion dollars into TRS care uh, in the last two legislative sessions alone. Um, and I think, candidly, one of the things that we made a mistake, you know, we, we look back on it now and say maybe we made a mistake, which was the session prior to this session, we should have made adjustments to the plan at that particular time. Um, but part of it is, is we get that. It's like you can't, you know, we struggled, I struggled when I was a school board member with increased cost of health insurance. It is a significant problem. You've got active care and the retirement care. And, you know, and, and you know, Chairman Zerwas, who, 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 you know, ran appropriations this last time, I can tell you, he, he knows how, how difficult it was and the, and the choices that you have to be able to make uh, to be able to provide a, a balanced plan. I think that's gonna be significant. 
we're going to be dealing with this next this next legislative session. We've made a deal. You know, I think anybody, anybody as a legislator, we've all looked at this from our perspective is that we made a deal with the teachers. We get that. We want to make sure we live with our bargain, right? And, uh, Representative Ashby carried the legislation last session uh, specifically related to TRS when we were dealing with this. And it was a struggle, and it was tough choices that we, that we had to be able to make. But we're not going to forget about it. We're going to live up with our end of, the, end of the deal. But we've got to get some of these costs contained. Y you can't have a, a plan that increases $700 million in one particular line item and expect it to be sustainable, because it's just not. Am I right, Gio? Or? No, that's exactly right. I remember even in, when we were having that conversation, I think you had said, hey, did you go back and negotiate this? And they're like, well, we'll go do it. And we, I was like a couple of hundred million right yeah. there. I mean, cost containment is going to be the key. Right. And it's just, it isn't sustainable. My first session, it was even, the amount of premiums that were being paid versus uh, how much the actual cost was. My second session, it was about a 650, 700 million shortfall, and we were at 1.6, 1.7 this yeah. time. You can just yeah. see the hockey stick And, and put the, just put this in perspective. When you think about the state of Texas from a general revenue perspective, general revenue in the state, uh, Chairman Zerwas, is 100 and, you probably know, 102, 103 billion dollars, somewhere in that perspective. The, the cost that we put in, 750 million dollars in 15, and over 500 million dollars this last legislative session, that's a huge number. One percent of your of your entire budget in, in one particular line item uh, that that has increased those costs. That's huge. And and so we're going to be focusing on that as we go forward. So when I hear people say, "Oh, we're 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 not we're not doing we're not doing enough," well, it's we put a significant amount of money in, 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 into into those plans as as we go forward. In addition to everything else that we have to do as we go forward. So we're very cognizant of that. I believe. We are out of time. Uh, let's thank our panelists, please. We are very fortunate to have these folks leading in our state. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Frey. Thank you, members. It's a great round of applause here. They, uh, I hope that what you're coming away from in these panels, you've been here, uh, what I'm proud of, and I listen to my colleagues, is. Uh, Hope you see the passion, the love that they have for the Lone Star State and the skill sets they bring to bear and the knowledge and expertise uh, and really thoughtfulness. Uh, this is your state government. Uh, and I hope you include me when you think of this favorably. I hope you think of me the same way. So uh, maybe I can chum off their good goodwill. But right now, speaking of goodwill, it's time for lunch. So we're going to break right now. If you can make your way, if you have a, a ticket, if, if purchased for the, uh, the, the meal, uh, Governor Greg Abbott is going to be our keynote speaker at lunch. We're going to start promptly at 1210. So please exit, go to the right to the Grand Ballroom, and we will see you down the hall. Thank you very much. <laughs>